The book of Ecclesiastes, it's part of the Bible's wisdom literature, and it opens with this line, the words of Kohelet, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Now in Hebrew, the word Kohelet, it means someone who has gathered people together. And in this case, it's to learn, so it's often translated in English as teacher. And the teacher is said to be a son or a descendant of King David. And so there are different views about who this figure might have been. Many think that it refers to King Solomon, others to maybe one of the later kings of David's line, and still others think that it's actually a later Israelite teacher who has adopted a Solomon-like persona as a teaching aid. Whichever of these views is correct, the key thing is to recognize that the teacher is a character in the book and is different than the author of the book, who remains anonymous. So we do hear the teacher's voice for most of the book, but it's actually a different voice, the author, who introduces us to the teacher in the first sentence and then at the end concludes the book by summarizing and evaluating everything the teacher just said. So the author is someone who wants us to hear all that the teacher has to say and then help us process it and form our own conclusion. So what does the teacher have to say? Well, the author summarizes the teacher's basic message at the beginning and right at the end, and it's hevel, hevel. Everything is utterly hevel. Now, most English Bibles translate this word hevel as meaningless, but that doesn't quite capture the heart of the idea. In Hebrew, hevel literally means vapor or smoke, and the teacher uses this word 38 times in the book as a metaphor to describe how life is, first of all, temporary or fleeting, like a wisp of smoke, but secondly, also how life is an enigma or a paradox. Like smoke, it appears solid, but when you try and grab onto it, there's nothing there. So there's so much beauty or goodness in the world, but just when you're enjoying it, tragedy strikes and it all seems to blow away. Or we all have a strong sense of justice, but all the time bad things happen to good people. So life is constantly, it's unpredictable, it's unstable, or in the teacher's words, like chasing after the wind. Hevel. Now that's kind of a downer. So why is he saying all of this? The author's basic goal is to target all of the ways that we try to build meaning and purpose in our lives apart from God. And he lets the teacher deconstruct these. So the author thinks we spend most of our time investing energy and emotion in things that ultimately have no lasting meaning or significance. And he lets the teacher give us a hard lesson in reality. You can see this most clearly in the opening and closing poems, which focus first of all on time and then on death. So the teacher says, you can spend your whole life working and achieving because you think that makes your life meaningful. You should really stop and consider the march of time. For all of the human effort that takes place in the world, nothing really ever changes. So sure, we develop technology and we build nations that rise and fall, but go climb a mountain and see if it cares. It was there long before any of us and it will be here long after. I mean, no one's even going to remember you or anything you did a hundred years from now, but that mountain, it'll still be there. And the ocean will still be breaking on the beach and the sun will still rise and set. And so time will eventually erase you and me and everything that we care about. And if that's not disheartening enough, the teacher also can't stop talking about death all the way through the book, but especially in this poem near the end. He says, death is the great equalizer and it renders meaningless most of our daily activities. It devours the wise and the fool, the rich and the poor, no matter who you are, what you've done, good or bad, we're all going to die and it's inescapable. So with these two ideas in hand, the teacher goes on to consider all the activities and false hopes that we invest our lives in to find meaning and significance, like wealth or career or social status or pleasure. So you think working hard is going to make life worth it? Think about the stress and the toll that that takes on you, all the anxiety and the sleepless nights. And by the time you actually earn some wealth, you're going to be too old to enjoy it anyway. And then by the time that you have to pass it on to someone, they may not even be someone who cares about anything that you did. Or maybe you think pleasure is going to make life worth it for you. Go for it. You know, live for your vacations. Live for the weekend party. Monday always comes. Hevel, hevel. Everything is utterly hevel. So what does the teacher advocate then? That we become pure hedonists or relativists? Well, no, that would be hevel too. 
The teacher acknowledges the ideas from Proverbs that living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, that these have real advantages. On the whole, life will probably go better for you. See, but the problem is that even living by wisdom and the fear of the Lord, they're hevel too, because they don't guarantee a good life. Good people die tragically, and horrible people live long and prosper. There's just too many exceptions, and so even wisdom is a hevel. Again, not meaningless, but an enigma. Wisdom doesn't work the way you think it should all of the time. So what's the way forward in the midst of all this hevel? And here, paradoxically, the teacher discovers the key to the true enjoyment of life under the sun. It's accepting hevel. It's acknowledging that everything in your life is totally out of your control. About six different times at some of the bleakest moments in his monologue, the teacher talks about the gift of God, which is the enjoyment of simple, good things in life, like friendship or family, a good meal or a sunny day. You can't control these things. You're certainly not guaranteed them, but that's their beauty. When I come to adopt a posture of total trust in God, it frees me to simply enjoy my life as I actually experience it, not as I think it ought to be, because even my expectations about what life ought to be are ultimately hevel, hevel. Everything under the sun is utterly hevel. And so the teacher's words come to a close. Right here at the end, the author speaks up again, and he brings it all to a conclusion. He says, the teacher's words are very important for us to hear. He likens them to a shepherd's staff with a goad, a pointy end, which might hurt when it pokes you. But he says the teacher is trying to poke you to get you to move in the right direction towards greater wisdom. The author then warns us that you can actually take the teacher's words too far, and you could spend your whole life buried in books trying to answer life's existential puzzles. Don't try, he says. You'll never get there. And so instead, the author offers his own conclusion, and it's this. Fear God and keep his commandments. This is the whole duty of humans, for God will bring every deed into judgment, every hidden thing, whether good or evil. And so the author thinks it's good to let the teacher challenge your false hopes and remind you that time and death make most of life completely out of your control. But what gives life true meaning is the hope of God's judgment, the hope that one day God will clear away all of the hevel and bring true justice to our world. And it's that hope that should fuel a life of honesty and integrity before God, despite the fact that I remain puzzled by most of life's mysteries. And that's the wisdom of the book of Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes Ecclesiastes 1 The words of the preacher, the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What does man gain by all the toil at which he toils under the sun? A generation goes, and a generation comes, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises, and the sun goes down, and hastens to the place where it rises. The wind blows to the south, and goes around to the north. Around and around goes the wind, and on its circuits the wind returns. All streams run to the sea, but the sea is not full. To the place where the streams flow, there they flow again. All things are full of weariness. A man cannot utter it. The eye is not satisfied with seeing, nor the ear filled with hearing. What has been is what will be, and what has been done is what will be done. And there is nothing new under the sun. Is there a thing of which it is said, See, this is new. It has been already in the ages before us. There is no remembrance of former things, nor will there be any remembrance of later things yet to be among those who come after. I, the preacher, have been king over Israel in Jerusalem, and I applied my heart to seek and to search out by wisdom all that is done under heaven. It is an unhappy business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. What is crooked cannot be made straight, 
and what is lacking cannot be counted. I said in my heart, I have acquired great wisdom, surpassing all who were over Jerusalem before me, and my heart has had great experience of wisdom and knowledge. And I applied my heart to no wisdom and to no madness and folly. I perceived that this also is but a striving after wind, for in much wisdom is much vexation, and he who increases knowledge increases sorrow. Ecclesiastes 2 I said in my heart, Come now, I will test you with pleasure, enjoy yourself. But behold, this also was vanity. I said of laughter, It is mad, and of pleasure, what use is it? I searched with my heart how to cheer my body with wine, my heart still guiding me with wisdom, and how to lay hold on folly, till I might see what was good for the children of man to do under heaven during the few days of their life. I made great works. I built houses and planted vineyards for myself. I made myself gardens and parks, and planted in them all kinds of fruit trees. I made myself pools from which to water the forest of growing trees. I bought male and female slaves, and had slaves who were born in my house. I had also great possessions of herds and flocks, more than any who had been before me in Jerusalem. I also gathered for myself silver and gold, and the treasure of kings and provinces. I got singers, both men and women, and many concubines, the delight of the children of man. So I became great and surpassed all who were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done, and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, all was vanity and a striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. So I turned to consider wisdom and madness and folly. For what can the man do who comes after the king? Only what has already been done. Then I saw that there is more gain in wisdom than in folly, as there is more gain in light than in darkness. The wise person has his eyes in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. And yet I perceive that the same event happens to all of them, then I said in my heart, What happens to the fool will happen to me also. Why then have I been so very wise? And I said in my heart, That this also is vanity. For of the wise as of the fool there is no enduring remembrance, seeing that in the days to come all will have been long forgotten. How the wise dies, just like the fool. So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and a striving after wind. I hated all my toil, in which I toil under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool? Yet he will be master of all for which I toiled and used my wisdom under the sun. This also is vanity. So I turned about, and gave my heart up to despair over all the toil of my labors under the sun. Because sometimes a person who has toiled with wisdom and knowledge and skill must leave everything to be enjoyed by someone who did not toil for it. This also is vanity and a great evil. What has a man from all the toil and striving of heart with which he toils beneath the sun? For all his days are full of sorrow and his work is a vexation. Even in the night his heart does not rest. This also is vanity. There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also, I saw, is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. 
but to the sinner he is given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity, and a striving after wind. Ecclesiastes 3 For everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to cast away stones, and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace, and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to seek, and a time to lose, a time to keep, and a time to cast away, a time to tear, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time for war, and a time for peace. What gain has the worker from his toil? I have seen the business that God has given to the children of man to be busy with. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Also, He has put eternity into man's heart, yet so that he cannot find out what God has done from the beginning to the end. I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Also, that everyone should eat and drink and take pleasure in all his toil. This is God's gift to man. I perceive that whatever God does endures forever. Nothing can be added to it, nor anything taken from it. God has done it, so that people fear before Him. That which is already has been, that which is to be already has been, and God seeks what has been driven away. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice even there was wickedness, and in the place of righteousness even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. I said in my heart, with regard to the children of man, that God is testing them, that they may see that they themselves are but beasts. For what happens to the children of man and what happens to the beasts is the same. As one dies, so dies the other. They all have the same breath, and man has no advantage over the beasts, for all is vanity. All go to one place, all are from the dust, and to dust all return. Who knows whether the spirit of man goes upward, and the spirit of the beast goes down into the earth. So I saw that there is nothing better than that a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. Who can bring him to see what will be after him? Ecclesiastes 4 Again, I saw all the oppressions that are done under the sun, and behold, the tears of the oppressed, and they had no one to comfort them. On the side of their oppressors there was power, and there was no one to comfort them. And I thought, the dead who are already dead, more fortunate than the living, who are still alive. But better than both is he who has not yet been, and has not seen the evil deeds that are done under the sun. Then I saw that all toil and all skill and work come from a man's envy of his neighbor. This also is vanity, and a striving after wind. The fool folds his hands, and eats his own flesh. Better is a handful of quietness than two hands full of toil and a striving after wind. Again I saw vanity under the sun. One person who has no other, either son or brother, yet there is no end to all his toil and his eyes are never satisfied with riches, so that he never asks, For whom am I toiling and depriving myself of pleasure? This also is vanity and an unhappy business. Two are better than one, because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, and has not another to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm, 
But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Better was a poor and wise youth than an old and foolish king who no longer knew how to take advice. For he went from prison to the throne, though in his own kingdom he had been born poor. I saw all the living who move about under the sun, along with that youth who was to stand in the king's place. There was no end of all the people, all of whom he led, yet those who come later will not rejoice in him. Surely this also is vanity, and a striving after wind. Ecclesiastes 5 Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. To draw near to listen is better than to offer the sacrifice of fools, for they do not know that they are doing evil. Be not rash with your mouth, nor let your heart be hasty to utter a word before God, for God is in heaven and you are on earth. Therefore, let your words be few. For a dream comes with much business, and a fool's voice with many words. When you vow a vow to God, do not delay paying it, for he has no pleasure in fools. Pay what you vow. It is better that you should not vow, than that you should vow and not pay. Let not your mouth lead you into sin, and do not say before the messenger that it was a mistake. Why should God be angry at your voice and destroy the work of your hands? For when dreams increase and words grow many, there is vanity. But God is the one you must fear. If you see in a province the oppression of the poor and the violation of justice and righteousness, do not be amazed at the matter, for the high official is watched by a higher, and there are yet higher ones over them. But this is gain for a land in every way, a king committed to cultivated fields. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is vanity. When goods increase, they increase who eat them, and what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much but the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture, and he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. This also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all his days he eats in darkness, in much vexation, and sickness and anger. Behold, what I have seen to be good and fitting is to eat and drink and find enjoyment and all the toil with which one toils under the sun, the few days of his life that God has given him, for this is his lot. Everyone also to whom God has given wealth and possessions and power to enjoy them, and to accept his lot and rejoice in his toil, this is the gift of God. For he will not much remember the days of his life, because God keeps him occupied with joy in his heart. Ecclesiastes 6 There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy on mankind. A man to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that he lacks nothing of all that he desires, yet God does not give him power to enjoy them, but a stranger enjoys them? This is vanity. It is a grievous evil. If a man fathers a hundred children, and lives many years, so that the days of his years are many, but his soul is not satisfied with life's good things, and he also has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he, for it comes in vanity, and goes in darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it has not seen the sun, or known anything, 
yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good, do not all go to the one place? All the toil of man is for his mouth, yet his appetite is not satisfied. For what advantage has the wise man over the fool? And what does the poor man have who knows how to conduct himself before the living? Better is the sight of the eyes than the wondering of the appetite. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what man is, and that he is not able to dispute with one stronger than he. The more words, the more vanity. And what is the advantage to man? For who knows what is good for man while he lives the few days of his vain life, which he passes like a shadow? For who can tell man what will be after him under the sun? And if you're watching us online, you can trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, right where you're at, right where you're sitting. The Bible, again, if you would just believe that Jesus died on the cross and paid for your sins and that he rose again the third day, God promises you that he will save your soul and adopt you as his child. And if you do that, we ask you to please email us uh, and let us know that you've done that. The email address is info, I-N-F-O, at exaltcc.com. That's I-N-F-O at exaltcc.com. Uh, let us know you've done that. We want to send you a Bible, help you in your next steps with uh, your relationship with the Lord. And if you have questions about this, you're like, I don't know about that, but I got some questions. Just please email us your questions. We'd love to answer those things uh, and, and help you understand the gospel better so that you too can trust in Christ as your Savior. Welcome back to our channel, Juice and Toya. Welcome back to another video. So in today's video, we're gonna take you through a full body dumbbell workout. Yep. Now this is a workout you can follow along with us. So you're gonna to wanna to use a pair of dumbbells that's moderate to lightweight because we're gonna do a lot of different exercises in this video. So for reference, I'm using a 20 pound set of dumbbells. And I'm using a 10 pound set of dumbbells. So the way we're gonna break this workout down, we're gonna do six lower, six upper, and three core exercises to finish it out. Yep. So we're gonna do each exercise for 45 seconds, and we're going to give you 15 second break in between, all right? And so in that 15 seconds, we're gonna show you what's next, the next exercise. And you can also use that time, grab a towel, grab a drink of water, or feel free to pause the video if you need a little bit longer break. So it is a follow along video. You can go at our pace and work with us, yep. or feel free to take it up a notch, go at your pace a little quicker or slow it down if you need to. So this is all done at your own pace. Exactly. So if you need a little warm up just to kind of warm your body up yep. before we get started, a lot go ahead of reps. and do that. Otherwise, we're gonna jump right into it. Let's get into it.
All right, guys, hopefully you got a nice workout. Yes, and Drop your a nice core is sweat. on fire and your arms are on fire. Exactly. So if this wasn't enough, if you want to go for another round, feel free to do so. You can yep. do two rounds, three rounds, make this 30 minutes, 45 minutes, just kind of make it work for you. Hey guys, Brent here from The X. Uh, thank you guys for watching our video. Um, we hope this is helping you on your Bible goals and uh, your other goals. And uh, be sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Also, check those links in the description for all the other uh, non-X material that came to make this video. Thank you guys again for watching and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and see you tomorrow.